you got something in your in your teeth. Yeah. Right. No. Right there. There. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sort well, of the. Should we? What are you? Oh, you're eating a cookie. Well, should we say hello to the Edge Kids? <laughs> Shout out sure. to fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. How are y'all doing? <clears throat> Hello, Edge kids. How's Sorry, you have to excuse Matt. He's got he's eating mouthful of food. Yeah. Food in his mouth. Chomp. Okay. Am I supposed to, are you, have you been recording this whole time or do you want me to ask? Yeah, y'all just keep going, but start, like, do something we can use as the, like, hey, welcome here. And We uh, said welcome. We said yeah. shout out. Shout out to the edge. Make sure you're wearing your face mask. I mean, that's really what? good. You guys, there's a duck in my house. There's a duck in your house? Okay, I'm going to catch it. <clears throat> Got the duck. You got it. <laughs> yeah. So what's the most ridiculous thing you've done in quarantine? Last weekend I went into tractor supply without a mask. You it was, live. So it says face mask. Does it have to cover your mouth? That's the whole point of it. It doesn't say mouth mask. <laughs> Okay. Can you even uh, see? Hold on. There, look. See, look. It doesn't say mouth mask. That is covering your mouth, though. Literally. And your nose. No, but what if it was like this? This is a face mask. Check it out. Double protection. What were you going to okay. say, Nikki? Oh, I was going to ask, I was going to do some questions that I thought the kids would think were more entertaining than our jobs. Um, <laughs> All right, shoot. Okay, <laughs> so have you been playing video games? On my phone, yes. No. Yeah. I watched Frozen 2 and Onward, and I recently watched Trolls World Tour. Was yes. that pretty good? Was it worth 20 bucks? No. No. Okay, good. No. Anyone uh, played any board games with their families? Shoots and ladders. Candyland. What up? We've done some puzzles. I don't think we've played any actual board games. But the the five piece puzzle with Arthur? Dominate on that one, right? Excuse me, Arthur can do a twelve piece puzzle. <laughs> Stand corrected. Right. How about you, Nikki? What games mm. have you played? I don't think what have we done? Oh, Jeff and I played um phase ten like pretty much every night. Phase ten? Yeah. Explain. You don't know what phase ten is? I probably do. I've probably played it plenty of times, just maybe these kids would love to play it. Uh not yet. Not yet. Like, Brenner's not into it yet. Ah. Uh, so what do you miss most from Sunday? In our class. Childcare. <laughs> I thought you were going to go changing diapers. Childcare. <laughs> okay, Matt, what's the second thing you miss most from our class? Donuts. And the third? Singing. <laughs> Getting beat up on in, uh, Touch football by Josh's team. Ah, uh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> the Josh, box. what do you miss most? I miss the community. I think it just like everybody getting together and you know really getting to you know be together in song and praise and worship and uh, also teach the lesson. Um, you know, it's it's a lot different. You know, trying to do it on you know Teams or you know Zoom. However, even like our real life groups have done it or how we've watched church too. You know, it's just the whole, there's, there's, a, there's a big difference between, and I think it really puts it into perspective, like the meaning of church and why we get together in worship. 
you know, when you're out by yourself watching TV and trying to like get your kids to sit down so you can watch service. <laughs> yes, no, and, of course I miss human interaction with, you know, or the ability to sit there and, and uh, be uh, to, to contemplate and meditate on, on scripture and have somebody, you know, I mean, obviously we get to hear the sermon, but uh, I do miss the ability to, to uh, sit there without children running around or get the ability to teach it. So yeah, of course. I miss hanging out with the girls, like the <laughs> sixth, fifth and fourth grade girls. Um, especially when we would hang out like right outside the, in the hallway. Um, so and I miss, um, we, we didn't play football like you guys, but we played I've Never. Never have and I ever. Have you ever played I've Never? I've played Never Have I Ever. Probably what is that? What it is? It, it, the whole premise, it's kind of like musical chairs where like there's one lush chair in the circle kind of, and um, whatever, <clears throat> like the person in the middle will say like, I've never done something and everyone who's done that has to get up and try to steal a chair, so. We play, the girls play that a lot, so. Okay, anything else you think the kids would like to hear us say? I miss asking them to be quiet, believe it or not, and cleaning up their hot chocolate spills. You miss that, you Josh? You so you are. <laughs> I got you on camera spilling hot chocolate. I kind of feel like I need to see Paxton sitting backwards in the chair. No, do you do you think that anyone's actually doing schoolwork? <laughs> <laughs> How, no, most of them are actually just doing the same thing because they uh, are homeschooled. I want everybody to give a shout out to what they're doing in school to the following number: five one two nine two three one zero. Claire's doing school because I married a hot teacher. <laughs> okay, so this week we're talking about the story of Esther. And um, Esther was put into a situation where she had to decide if she was going to speak up or not to save her people. And what we're going to learn is she was really brave even though it meant she could have been killed. So what's the most brave thing you've ever done? Brave thing I ever did. Mm. I don't know, I guess just flying at night was pretty scary. Fly at night on MPGs. Uh, um, we flew at night from Djibouti, <laughs> which is a real country. <laughs> you know what the capital of Djibouti is? What? Djibouti. Yeah, Djibouti, Djibouti. Uh, from Djibouti, we flew 50 miles at night, really, no moon, with four helicopters back to the ship. Okay, so Matt, tell and us I was like little, what. I was a little scared. Why did y'all fly without wrong? light? Like, said it, like, help us see what could have gone wrong. Why was it so scary? Um, it was really disorienting, so you could get vertigo and, you know, crash, for lack of a better term. Uh, you could, it was really hard to tell, it's really hard to tell, like, on your NVGs or goggles, your night vision goggles, it's hard to see, uh, people, like, the, your visual acuity or how well you can see is kind of degraded, so you could run into each other easily, and then, you know, the boat is moving, so you might not make it back to the boat. Or, or you'll make it back to the boat, but maybe the boat's not where you need it to be. Or, you know, you got to fly around the more, maybe get low on gas. So, I was pretty, it, it was, it, it wasn't like, it was pre-planned. But I would say it was still a little bit, it was still a little bit uh, scary. I don't know. I had some, I mean, I did some stuff in Afghanistan, too, that was kind of unique. So, I don't know. You're very, you're very well prepared for that. I would, you know, I'd say that some stuff that takes more bravery might be uh, things that 
you do in normal everyday life or speaking to someone about the gospel actually takes a lot of bravery. Mm -hmm. Josh? My, the one I can think of right off the bat is, so when my dad passed away, um, so we had, that was October of 2018. And <clears throat> so, you know, we had his um, celebration of life and then a memorial service and uh, he was cremated. Um, so there were honorary pallbearers and, you know, one of the things is, you know, who carries the urn, you know, to the final resting place. And it had crossed, you know, just this voice in my head on our way down from the church to Stonewall, you know, it's just like, you should do this. This is, you know, this is something you should do. And, you know, we had talked about it previously and the pastor and even the, and also the guy that kind of runs the, the, the funeral and how it goes. He's like, no, it, we just see it's too hard. Well, we got, we get down there and I pulled up behind the fire truck. Uh, so he was transported in a fire truck. Um, and I just, I walked straight to the fire truck and I knew who was driving it. It was my first cousin and second cousin. So there in the middle between them was the urn and I asked for it. And, you know, both the, pa both pastors came and just surrounded me and, you know, it was the, you know, at the time, like, just doing it, it was, I'm glad I did it. Some of the best memories, um, you know, it's a good memory, but, and at the same time, it just, it was so, you know, it was tough, but at the same time, it was something that, you know, just the voice in my head, and I felt like that was God or my dad just coming over me, and it was, you know, kind of his, maybe his last, you know, wish, so to say. So. I think for me, <clears throat> I would say it's the opportunities I've had to share the gospel. There's nothing that makes me more nervous and makes me like shake in my feet. I mean, just everywhere. Um, then but in the moments where I just feel very strongly that I'm supposed to share, um, those are probably the moments that required the most bravery. So. Any examples, Nikki? Yeah. So I am, um, <clears throat> when I was in middle school, there was this guy that had come to our school and he and I sat and had lunch together most days and he clearly did not believe in the, the Bible. He didn't believe in God. And um, <clears throat> so every day at lunch, we would have these conversations about um, why why I felt like you should believe in God and what, what the evidence was. And um, he would share his point of view. And, um, and he ended up, he never like came to a point where he put his faith in Christ or anything like that. And then um, <clears throat> we kind of parted ways because he moved. And um, I remember we were off in college and he wrote like a note or I got a letter from him saying that probably one of the most meaningful experiences in his life um, were our lunches and the conversations we had. So. Right on. Yeah. The book of Esther, it's one of the more exciting and curious books in the Bible. The story is set over 100 years after the Babylonian exile of the Israelites from their land. And while some Jews did return to Jerusalem, remember Ezra and Nehemiah, many did not. And so the book of Esther is about a Jewish community living in Susa, the capital city of the ancient Persian Empire. And the main characters in this story are two Jews, Mordecai and then his niece Esther. And then there's the king of Persia, who's something of a drunken pushover in this story. And then there's the Persian official Haman, the cunning villain. Now this is a curious book in the Bible, mainly for the fact that God is never even mentioned, not once. Which might strike you as kind of odd. I mean, isn't the Bible about God? 
But this is a brilliant technique by the author, who's anonymous, by the way. It's an invitation to read this story looking for God's activity, and there are signs of it everywhere. The story is full of very odd, quote, coincidences and ironic reversals, and it all forces you to see God's purpose at work, but behind the scenes. Let's just dive into the story. The book opens with the king of Persia throwing two elaborate banquet feasts that last a total of 187 days, and it's all for the grandiose purpose of displaying his greatness and splendor. On the last day of the banquet feast, he's really drunk, and he demands that his wife, Queen Vashti, appear at the party to show off her beauty. She refuses, and so in a drunken rage, the king deposes Vashti and makes the silly decree that all Persian men should now be the masters of their own homes. Then he holds a beauty pageant because he wants to find a new queen. This is like a really bad soap opera. But it's right here that we're introduced to Esther and Mordecai. Esther hides her Jewish identity and enters the beauty pageant and wins. And the king is so obsessed with Esther that he elevates her to become the new queen of Persia. Now after this, and even more serendipitous, is the fact that Mordecai just happens to overhear two royal guards plotting to murder the king. And so he informs Esther, who in turn informs the king, and Mordecai gets credit for saving the king's life. Now, right here from the beginning, God's not mentioned anywhere, but this all seems providentially ordered. What is it that God's up to? You have to keep reading. We're next introduced to Haman, who's not actually a Persian. He's called an Agagite. He's a descendant of the ancient Canaanites. Remember 1 Samuel chapter 15. The king elevates Haman to the highest position in the kingdom, and he demands that everybody kneel before Haman. Well, when Mordecai sees Haman, he refuses to kneel, which of course fills Haman with rage. And when he finds out that Mordecai's Jewish, Haman successfully persuades the king to enact this crazy decree to destroy all of the Jewish people. And to decide the date of the Jews' annihilation, Haman rolls the dice. A die is called pur in Hebrew. Tuck that away for later. Eleven months later, on the 13th of Adar, all the Jews will die. Haman and the king then have a drinking banquet to celebrate their really horrible decision. So the focus now turns to Mordecai and Esther, who are the only hope for the Jewish people. They make a plan that Esther is going to reveal her Jewish identity to the king and ask him to reverse the decree. But approaching the king without a royal request is, according to Persian law, an act worthy of death. So in a key statement, Mordecai, he's confident that even if Esther remains silent, that deliverance for the Jews will arrive from another place. And then Mordecai wonders aloud. He says, who knows? Maybe you've become queen for this very moment. Esther responds with bravery, and she purposes to go to the king with her amazing words, if I perish, I perish. Now, in what unfolds, we watch the ironic reversal of all of Haman's evil plans. So Esther hosts the king and Haman at a first banquet, and she says that she wants to make a special request of both of them at an exclusive banquet the following day. So Haman leaves the banquet totally drunk, and he sees Mordecai in the street. He fumes with anger, and he orders that a tall stake be built so that Mordecai can be impaled upon it in the morning. It seems like things can't get any worse for the Jews and for Mordecai, but all of a sudden, the story pivots. It just so happens that night, the king, he can't sleep, and he has the royal chronicles read to him for good bedtime reading, and he just happens to hear about how Mordecai had saved the king's life. He had totally forgotten. So in the morning, Haman enters to request Mordecai's execution, and the king in that moment orders Haman to honor Mordecai publicly for saving his life. So now Haman has to lead Mordecai around the city on a royal horse, telling everyone to praise him. Now this moment in the story, it's a pivot for the whole book. It begins Haman's downfall and Mordecai's rise to power. Watch how this works. The day after is Esther's second banquet. So the king and Haman arrive, and Esther informs the king that first of all, she's Jewish, and second, that Haman has enacted a decree to murder her and to murder Mordecai, who saved his life, and to murder all of the Jews. Now the king's had a lot to drink, so when he hears this news, he goes into yet one more drunken rage, and he orders that Haman be impaled on the very stake he made for Mordecai. It's ironic and a grisly way for Haman to go. 
Haman's execution, however, doesn't solve the problem of the decree to kill all of the Jews. So the focus now turns to Esther and Mordecai as they make a plan to reverse the decree. They discover that the king can't revoke a decree that he's already made. So instead, the king commissions Mordecai to issue a counter decree. On the appointed day that all of the Jews were supposed to be killed, the 13th of Adar, now the Jews are ordered to defend themselves and to destroy any who plotted to kill them. Then Mordecai, Esther, and Jews everywhere hold banquets and feasts to celebrate this new decree, and Mordecai is elevated to a seat beside the king. Eventually, the decreed day comes, and the Jews triumph over their enemies. First, they destroy Haman's family, and then any other Persian officials who had joined in Haman's plot. And then on a second day, they get permission to destroy any who plotted against them throughout the entire kingdom. This results in joy and celebration as the Jews are rescued from annihilation. The story then tells about how Esther and Mordecai establish by decree this annual two-day feast of Purim to commemorate their deliverance from destruction. And the name of the feast comes from Haman's dice. Remember, Purim. The book concludes with a short epilogue as Mordecai is elevated to second in command in the kingdom and we are told now of his royal greatness and splendor as the Jews thrive in exile. Now, step back. Notice how this whole story has been designed. The story was full of moments of ironic reversal, but we can now see the whole story is structured as an ironic reversal, right down to the details. So the king's splendor and feasts and decrees are mirrored by Mordecai's splendor and feasts and decrees at the end. Esther and Mordecai, they first saved the king, but now in the end, they save all of the Jews. Then you have Haman's elevation and edicts and banquet that gets reversed by Mordecai's elevation and edict and banquet. And then at the center, you have Esther and Mordecai's planning scenes, and then Esther's two banquets that act as a frame around the greatest moment of reversal in the whole story, Haman's humiliation and Mordecai's exaltation beautiful. Another fascinating feature of this book is the moral ambiguity of the characters. There's a lot of drinking and anger and sex and murder of which Mordecai and Esther are a part, not to mention their violation of many commands in the Torah, like marrying Gentiles or eating impure foods. And so the story is not putting Mordecai and Esther forward as moral example as if it endorses all of their behavior. But they are put forward as models of trust and hope when things get really bad. And so the book of Esther comes back to that question with which we begin, why God is not mentioned. The message of this book seems to be that when God seems absent, when his people are in exile, when they're unfaithful to the Torah, does this mean that God is done with Israel? Has God abandoned his promises? And the book of Esther says, no. It invites us to see that God can and does work in the real mess and moral ambiguity of human history. And he uses the faithfulness of even morally compromised people to accomplish his purposes. And so the book of Esther asks us to be willing to trust God's providence even when we can't see it working. And to hope that no matter how bad things get, God is committed to redeeming his world. And that's what the book of Esther is all about. Thanks for joining us. We miss you guys so much. We are um, we're praying for you, and we're we're staying at home with you. We can't wait to be with you at church. And thanks for joining us today. And if y'all will take a moment, I'll lead us in prayer. Uh, Father God, we we thank you for this opportunity to to get together and give a shout out to these, uh, to the edge of the fourth, fifth and sixth graders. Father God, we ask that you're watching over them in this time of uncertainty. And while they, while they might be scared of the uncertainty or hesitant of what's going to happen tomorrow, Lord, we know you're with us and you know that you're going to help, help steer this, um, steer this ship or helicopter down the right way, Lord. We ask that you uh, continue to guide us and just continue to help keep us uh, safe and uh, just heal those that are sick, Lord, and just continue to open up these kids' uh, minds and just uh, nourish them with the word and feed them, uh, feed them as much knowledge as possible during this time, Lord, and just uh, also a, a time for them to relax um, as well, Lord. And uh, we pray for their parents as uh, they're also uh, dedicating their time, dedicating um, just their, their day-to-day -day activities to help continue with their education and help to continue with um, 
what it is they might need to be doing, Lord. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. Bye, guys. Y'all take Bye. care. Take care. But I can't do it unless I got some. It's better without music. <laughs> this is streaming live on Facebook. Ha, 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 ha.